Thank you for listening to this message from the pulpit of New Grace Baptist Church in Roanoke, Virginia. We hope the message you are about to hear is a blessing to you and your family. All right, uh, get your Bibles over to Daniel chapter 7. Uh, Daniel chapter 7, as we continue studying the end times, um, we're going to look, finish looking at the book of Daniel this morning. Now, last week we looked at Daniel chapter 2. And we looked at the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had uh, had a dream about and God's interpretation of it. And, of course, we saw, just to review, uh, we saw that it had a, the head um, was gold. And this, of course, represented Babylon. The, the chest of silver represented Persia. The thighs of brass represented Greece. Uh, and then the legs and the feet of iron and clay represented the Roman Empire. Um, and then, of course... Summary of chapter two: um, We said that the uh, that the statue is a Gentile world empires, and as they become stronger, they also become less uh, majestic. Um, the, and the age of the Gentiles is going to last until Christ returns and ends the age of the Gentiles. And the end of the age of the Gentiles will end the Gentiles' rule over the Jews. And we said that God's kingdom cannot arrive until the age of the Gentiles is over. So this morning, we're going to look at Daniel chapter 7. And Daniel's dream, uh, we're also going to be looking at Daniel chapter 9, looking at Daniel's prayer. Um, Now, Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 2 are the same thing. God is explaining the exact same thing to two different people in two different ways. Uh, But instead of with Nebuchadnezzar, God gave him a dream that represented a timeline. He gives Daniel a dream that involves nature. Uh, So let's look at 1 Daniel chapter 7. Look at verse number 3. And four great beasts came up from the sea, Diverse from one another, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it, and they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld... And lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beasts also had four heads, and dominions were given over it. So first we're going to look at the, uh, the lion uh, in Daniel chapter number 7. So it's the same thing as in Daniel chapter 2. So since the first thing Nebuchadnezzar saw was the head of gold, and that represented what? Babylon. Babylon. What does the lion represent? No, yes, it's Babylon. <laughs> yeah, the lion also represents Babylon. Now, there's a modern, there is actually modern day proof of this. When the uh, American military invaded Iraq the, this last time, um, they found the ancient city of Babylon, and when they were there, they found this. This is called the Statue of Babylon, uh, and it's called the Lion of Babylon. Uh, it is devouring a man. But what do you notice about the lion? Those things right there used to have wings, but they fell off, obviously. So there are, there are murals all over ancient, uh, ancient, the ancient world that have, uh, ancient Babylon, that have lions with wings. This was kind of like, you know, like a, an eagle represents America, a flying lion, flying lion. Uh, a flying lion uh, represents Babylon. It was the national image of Babylon. And so this is what Daniel saw in his dream. He saw a lion with wings. Then we have the bear with ribs in its mouth. Uh, This represents the Persian Empire. Uh, Now, bears are less majestic than lions. Lions are these beautiful, incredible creatures, and lions are just fierce and scare the fire. Unless it's a panda bear. Panda bears are awesome. Grizzly bears are not. They will scare the fire out of you. 
uh, but they are, they are less majestic, but they are much stronger. Um, the way they defeated their, en their enemies was through brute force. Just sheer numbers. They would outnumber their enemy and just throw as many men as they could at them and just overpower them with, with sheer force. <clears throat> so they were made up of three previous, the Persian Empire was made up of three previous kingdoms that joined together to defeat the Babylonians. That's what has three ribs in its mouth. Then we have Alexander the Great uh, as the leopard. Uh, he was known for speed and his army moved like a leopard. Also, the leopard has four heads and four wings. When Alexander the Great died, what was his kingdom divided into? Four kingdoms, uh, four regions. Um, so, so far we're following the same uh, pattern that the statue followed. Babylon, Persia, Greece. Um, now, why did God... Why did God include this? Why did God give Daniel this dream if he's just repeating uh, what he said and to Nebuchadnezzar? Uh, for that, we've got to understand the fourth beast. So look at Daniel chapter 7 again, starting in verse number 7. <clears throat> After this, I saw in the night visions, and the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, I speaking great things. So the first... Three examples, or the first three things Daniel sees in his vision are recognizable animals. He sees these animals, it's a lion, it's a bear, it's a leopard. Yeah, the lion has wings, the bear's got ribs sticking out of his mouth, and the leopard has four heads and four sets of wings, but he knows what they are. He can see them, he can recognize them, he can, he can put his, you know, say, that's what that is. This fourth beast, he can't even, he can't even recognize. He has no, he has no animal uh, to describe it to. Uh, now, there's a lot of artists that come up with ideas about what this beast looks like, and a lot of them look like dinosaurs. Uh, I looked at a lot of images of this fourth beast, and a lot of people think he's talking about a T-Rex, a ceratops with a lot of extra horns or some kind of thing. Um, but here's one that I think is, is close to it. Still a creepy little beast. Still nothing, you, you know, that's not that's nothing you're going to pick up at a pet store. Uh, you see that, you're moving. <clears throat> um, now the horns are the focus of this creature. David spends a lot of time talking about the horns. There were four, there were ten horns. Then a little horn grew out of those horns. So what's the purpose of those horns? That's why we're here. Look at Daniel chapter, uh, chapter look at verse 7, uh, ah, chapter 7. Start in verse number 19. <clears throat> then uh, I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. Now remember real quick, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the legs of iron had defeated and basically blown away the residue of all the other kingdoms. So he's talking about the same thing. These kingdoms, as they progress through time, they are going to eliminate every kingdom before them. <coughs> uh, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell... Even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So there you go. That's the explanation. Everybody understand, right? All right. Now, again, notice the mention of crushing and breaking into pieces. At the end of these four kingdoms... Um, we have the kingdom of God that rises up. We saw that last week when the boulder comes and destroys the statue and, God, and the mountain grows out of it. That is God setting up his kingdom. 
And then we get this interpretation that uh, Daniel got from the uh, angel of God. So the, an angel comes to Daniel in chapter 7 and really explains to him what he's seen in this dream. Uh, so look at verse 23. Um, thus he said, <clears throat> The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from them, uh, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and to think to change, the, to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. I know this is getting confusing. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the fourth ki- and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Uh, so we're talking about the fourth kingdom, and that is, of course, the, the kingdom we are currently living in but we're getting a little more information than we got from Daniel chapter 2. Because Daniel chapter 7 tells us that towards the end of the age, or towards the end of that fourth kingdom, some specific things are going to happen. Uh, He's going to say there are going to be ten kings that rule the whole world. Now, again, Daniel's time, that kings was, was what they thought of in our time, you know, we're talking presidents or prime ministers or whatever. But there's going to be a, a conglomerate, an organization of ten that rule everything. Then an eleventh will show up to start ruling with them. And this eleventh king or president or whatever is going to be different from, from all the rest. So Daniel 7 confirms what we saw in Daniel chapter 2. It confirms the kingdoms and the order that they will appear on the earth. There are going to be four Gentile kingdoms, but the fourth kingdom is going to be unique and different from all the rest. And so Daniel chapter 7, it really focuses on the fourth kingdom over the others, because the others are really, you know, they're, they're kind of no big deal, you know, they're, they're standard, everybody knows what they're going to be like, but this fourth kingdom is going to be vastly uh, different. Uh, and he gives us a detailed, a detailed description about what's going to happen on the earth during this fourth kingdom. Uh, and so we can know what to happen. And we just learned that during the fourth kingdom, we will eventually arrive at a time where the world will be led by only ten rulers. Have we gotten there yet? Are there ten kingdoms ruling this earth? No. There's one, capitalism. No. (laughs) No, we're not not at a place yet where ten kingdoms lead the entire world. So there's never been a time since Rome uh, became the fourth kingdom that we can say that the dominant power on the earth is led by ten leaders. So we're not there yet. We saw this in Daniel chapter 2 as well. Uh, The statue ends with uh, feet of clay and iron. How many toes do feet have? Ten. Unless you had a lawnmower accident, you've got ten toes. So even Daniel chapter 2 gives us the ten rulers of this kingdom. Uh, so we know that at the end of the age, that is what's going to happen on the earth, that the world will be led by ten kingdoms. So right before Jesus returns to set up his earthly kingdom, the world's going to be ruled by, by ten kings. So here's another way to look at it. Um, now, this is, the, this is the statue, but it's on its side. All right, That's how we're going to view this. Um, so we've reached the fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom is going to continue until we reach that east-west division, which we have reached when, when uh, Greece broke up and Rome became 
different. So we've reached that east-west division, and we have an imperialistic uh, democratic rule. So we're still doing that. At some time, we're going to reach a time where only ten kings rule the world essentially. But at some point, those ten kings, they have power. At some point during that, an eleventh king is going to show up. He's going to be different than everybody else. He's going to assume power over all the, all the rest. Uh, he seems to come out of nowhere. You and your son. <laughs> you and your son just ruining everything. <laughs> all right. Yes. Well, that means you were explaining it so well. Yes. This 11th king, who is also the Antichrist, spoiler alert, is going to show up. And he's gonna. At first, he's gonna start working with these ten kings, but eventually, these ten, ten kings are gonna get tired of him. They're gonna want to overthrow him. Three of them are going to start a rebellion to overthrow him, but he's gonna be victorious, and he's gonna have three kings removed. Now, we are gonna learn how this happens in Revelation chapter thirteen. The eleventh king. Wants to rule the world, but the ten don't want him to. So three rise against him. They, they actually kill him. Three days later, he comes back from the dead. That's why he is the Antichrist. Because people see him risen from the dead. They think he is the Christ. So they worship him as the Messiah. But they got his name wrong by, by four letters. He's the, not Christ, he is the anti-Christ. Uh, after, after he succeeds from rising from the dead, he kills the three kings that, that killed him. And let's be honest, you can't blame him. Someone kills you and you come back from the dead, you're going to want to kill them too. I mean, it's just, it's human nature. So he rises from the dead, he kills these three guys, and their seven remaining kings fall in line real quick. Yes, because <laughs> again, you got one guy that three guys murder, then he comes back three days later and kills them, you're going to fall in line real, real fast. Uh, so they, they end up with this one guy ruling the world with his seven lieutenants, are basically what they become. That continues until the rock comes from heaven and destroys everything, and that is Christ's uh, return to earth. So this fourth Gentile kingdom, is going to continue on the earth until Jesus comes back to set up his earthly kingdom. After Jesus arrives, Daniel 2 tells us that this mountain grows out of that rock and it covers the earth, and we arrive at the age to come, which is Christ's kingdom. So this is how I illustrated it in your handout. So you can kind of clearly see, hopefully clearly see, uh, what's going on with these two dreams. These kingdoms are going to increase in strength as a decrease in majesty. They're going to continue until Christ returns to destroy them in his kingdom. Now, that's, that's the hard part of this lesson. Why does the age of the gen just The gutters are full. <laughs> Sorry. You know I Squirrel! It happens. All right. <laughs> Why did God... I, I know, I did it. I'm sorry. Why did God institute the age of the Gentiles? That's the fundamental question of Daniel. Deuteronomy tells us that. So turn in the Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 29. We're going to be doing a lot of flipping between Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and Daniel. Um... So Deuteronomy chapter number 29. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Deuteronomy is where Moses is, is reading the law to Israel as they are, they are kind of entering a new generation. They are, have been wandering in the wilderness for, for 40 years. Moses is about to die. Joshua is about to take over. The older generation that rebelled against God has died off. So Moses is kind of, one last time, reminding this new, younger generation about what God has for them. So look at Deuteronomy chapter 29, starting in verse number 10. <clears throat> and I'm in 28. 
All right, Deuteronomy chapter 29, still in verse 28. Uh, <coughs> starting in verse number 10, it says, Ye stand this day, all of you before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribes, your elders, and your officers, with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and thy stranger that is in thy camp, from the hewer of thy wood unto the drawer of thy water, that thou shouldest enter into a covenant with the Lord thy God, and into his oath which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day, that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself, and that he may be unto thee a God, as he has said unto thee, and as he has sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us uh, this day. So this, this is, is, God, is Moses using God. Moses is standing before the Israel and he is telling them, God wants to enter into a covenant with you. He wants to enter into a contract with you where he's going to bless you He's going to take care of you. He's going to set up His kingdom through you on this earth. And all you have to do is obey His law. But here's the thing. This covenant that God makes with Israel is not just with the Jews present that day. It's for every Jewish person, every member of the nation of Israel, from that day all the way to the end of time. So God is making a commitment not with just one group of people. He's making a group of a covenant with a nation. It's not an individual covenant, but it's a covenant that all of Israel is bound to for all time. Think about it this way. There are six billion gallons of water in Smith Mountain Lake. If you went there and you isolated and you named in one day every molecule of water in that lake. And you came back one year later. Do you still have the same water molecules? No, all those individual molecules have run down the river. Do you still have Smith Mountain Lake? Yeah, it's still there. Different water molecules, different individual molecules, but still just water. And so God is like, yeah, I'm making a covenant with, with these Jews here, but this covenant is for every Jewish person throughout history. Um, so it's not just those there. It's every Jew throughout history. So this covenant was made with the Israelites, not just at that time, but for all of time. Now, that, that is where that, that there is an Israel today, there is an Israel a thousand years ago, and there will be an Israel tomorrow. It will be made up by, of a different group of Jewish people, but they're still... Israel. They're still the nation of Israel. So the covenant is with the group, not the individuals of the group. So if you are a part of Israel, how many of you here are Jewish 100%? Yeah, none of us. Uh, but if you were, even if you didn't, you weren't there when Moses made this agreement, you didn't sign this contract, but you're under it. So this covenant was made with the nation of Israel for all of uh, uh, history. Um, now look at Leviticus chapter 26, verse number 2. I think I put these on the screen for you, just in case. <clears throat> but I do encourage you to look them up anyway. And I didn't mark them, so I'm giving you plenty of time to turn there. All right, Leviticus chapter 26, starting verse number 2. Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If ye walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season. The land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall uh, bear, uh, shall yield their fruit. So God tells Israel... That this is the covenant that, that Moses is reminding them of in Deuteronomy, but he's making it here in Leviticus. That God will bless Israel incredibly, and he will bless them wonderfully if they keep the law of God perfectly. If they never break 
one of God's laws, God's going to bless them. Now, is this just for that group of Jews? It's for every Jew who ever lived. So God is telling Israel, if every Jew who ever lives keeps my law perfectly all the time, I'm going to bless you. This is a bad deal, but Israel signed it. Now, there's a purpose to God making this covenant with them. Now, the next 13 verses, God goes on to tell them how He's going to bless them. Skip down to verse 14. But if you will not hearken unto me, and you will not do all these commandments, and if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, but ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, the burning ague and that consumes the eyes and cause sorrow in the, of heart, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. So God warns them what's going to happen if they break His covenant. And there's 13 verses explaining God saying, I'm going to bless you if you keep my covenant. There's 26 God saying, this is what's going to happen if you don't. So God gives them a severe warning about what's going to happen if they break His, his covenant. So he, he gives them the rule. He gives them the, the opportunity to be blessed, the opportunity of curses, before He makes this covenant with them. And it's a national government. Every single Jew in every single generation must keep every single law of God perfectly. And if even one messes up, one time, one Jew has one bad day and takes the Lord's name in vain one time because he stumped his toe, covenant's broken. It's a severe penalty that God's given them. Uh, so if one guy messes up, they all suffer the consequences. Now, obviously, that didn't ha- more than one guy messed up. Because Can you imagine being that one guy? <laughs> <laughs> they kept it for, for like 100 years and then one guy messes up. And everybody messes up. But anyway, they all messed up. It doesn't look like a good deal. That's why Moses, he asked them in Leviticus to make this covenant. They agreed. Then he asked the next generation in Deuteronomy, you sure? You sure you want to make this? This is a severe contract. That if you keep it, great. But I know you people, you can't keep it. Are you sure you want to go into this contract? So, uh, so that tells us, why does the age of the Gentiles exist? Um, because, so, uh, because God, the age of the Gentile exists because God made a deal with Israel. Every Jew in every generation has to keep the law perfectly to receive the blessings of the kingdom of God. But, if one Jew breaks the law one time, then the nation has broken the covenant and God curses the nation. So, the age of the Gentiles is the fulfillment of the curses of the old covenant on Israel. God made a covenant with them. They broke the covenant. So God instituted the age of the Gentiles where the Gentile nations ruled over them and oppressed them as judgment for breaking their covenant. The the age of the Gentiles is the curse on the Jewish nation. Makes you feel real good, doesn't it? That we, we're used to, to curse people. All right. <clears throat> that God's used us as a curse. Uh, it, is, uh, it is God acted according to the old covenant law to fulfill what His Word said He would do to His people who couldn't be keeping the law. Now, you're probably thinking the same thing. There's no way that every Jew and every generation keep the law perfectly. No one can keep it perfectly. And that's the point. That's why God made the covenant with them. Look in, back in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 30. <clears throat> Starting in verse number 6. <clears throat> and the Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and that thou mayest live. Uh, and the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and upon uh, and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I commanded thee this day. 
and the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every uh, work of thine hand, and the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy, jo- all thy soul. So what Moses is saying here is God knows they are not going to keep his word. He knows that not just one guy one time in one bad moment is going to mess it up, but they're all going to mess it up. And they're going to mess it up a lot. And they're going to suffer these curses. But God says, at some point, Israel will return to him. And he will bless them like he promised to bless them before. Because they, he will institute this kingdom. So at well, some point, Israel will return to her land. He says their hearts are going to be circumcised. And at some point in time, Israel will live in perfect obedience to the law of God. Then, they're going to receive the blessing of the Old Covenant, and they're going to prosper in their land. And so when Israel can keep the law perfectly, then they will receive the kingdom that God has promised them. It still seems impossible. But we're going to see later, not tonight, but later in the study, how God is going to fulfill uh, this promise. But how can Israel ever keep the law perfectly and satisfy the terms of the Old Covenant? Yes? Oh, I thought you raised your hand like you wanted to answer. Um, You sure you don't want to spoil it for me? All right. There's a loophole in the law. Look back at Leviticus. I know what you're flipping back and forth. Leviticus chapter 26. God gave them a loophole. (coughs) Verse number 40. If they shall confess in their iniquity, if they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespass against me, and that also they have walked uh, contrary to unto me, then skip down to verse 42, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember and I will remember the land. So God... He says, look, the, the only, you can receive the blessing by obeying all the law, all the time, never messing up. Or, there's a second way. All of Israel has to confess not just their sins, but the sins of their fathers. At some point in time, Israel is going to recognize Jesus as the Messiah, and they're going to confess their sin of crucifying Him on the cross in the first place. Now, I'm glad they did it. If they didn't do it, we'd be in trouble. He had, they had to do it. That's the whole point of the whole story. But at some point, they're going to confess, He's the Messiah. We sinned against Him when He came the first time. We rejected Him. We cursed Him. We spit upon Him. We killed Him. We confess that He, he is God. And as they do that, it is a national confession of faith. And the entire nation will receive the blessings that God has promised them. Now, God will set aside the Old Covenant on the basis of the Abrahamic covenant. If each individual Jew, um, here's what I mean by that. If an individual Jew comes to faith today, if a Jewish person recognizes Jesus as Messiah and confesses Him as their Savior, they come out from the law just like we do. They're not, they're not subject to it, just like we're not. Israel's still under the law right now, but they, of course, are violating it all the time. Uh, That's the point of it. Um, We are not under the law. And if a Jew gets saved, they are not under the law, just like anybody else. They are saved by faith, but the nation continues under the curse. Before we get to chapter 9, we want to summarize this. The Old Covenant requires perfect obedience to the law by every Jew in every generation throughout history. Failure to keep the law perfectly brings on the curses of the law. The age of the Gentiles is the fulfillment of those curses. 
and that's the age we're currently living in. We are living under the fulfillment of the, on the, the, Gentile, the age of the Gentiles as judgment on the nation of Israel. One day, Israel will confess Christ as the Savior, and as a result, the rock will return and will set up his kingdom, and the age of the Gentile ends. When is that going to happen? Yeah. That happens, that's after the rapture, during the tribulation, and that's going to, like, bring into the entrance of Christ coming to rule. Yes. So I got that right. Yes. Huh. <laughs> <coughs> sort of. Now, we're going to see when it happens in Daniel chapter 9. So in Daniel 9... Daniel is, is still living in captivity, and he is reading the law. He reads the covenant God made with Israel. He knows they have violated God's law. And so, um, we're going to read a little bit of Daniel chapter 7, but not a whole lot of it. So yeah, flip over there real quick. He realizes that they have violated the law, and that the, they are suffering the punishment of the law. And he reads the prophet Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah, he reads about 70 years. And so he believes that the age of the Gentiles is going to last 70 years. He is wrong. Obviously wrong. Um, get back to Daniel here. Uh. Boop, 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 boop. All right, so he reads that and he's wrong. So what does he do? In uh, Daniel chapter 9, verses 4 through 19, he prays. And he prays this loophole that we saw in Leviticus. He confesses the sin of Israel. He confesses his sins. He confesses his forefathers' sins. He confesses everybody's sins, thinking he is going to usher in the kingdom of God. Obviously, he was wrong. So God, in chapters, verses 20 through 23, sends an angel to rebuke him. Uh, the angel rebukes him, and then Gabriel, in chapter 20, uh, verse 24, Gabriel corrects him. So look in chapter 9, I want to read one verse real quick, and then we get into the to math. There's a lot of math going on after this. Uh, chapter 9, verse number 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So God, Daniel tells him, it's not 70 years, it's 70 weeks. Now, uh, 70 weeks has been decreed for the age of Gentiles, not... Uh, 70 years. Now, obviously, it's been more than 70 years. It's also been a lot longer than 70 weeks, right? Now, weeks in Hebrew just means seven. Like if I said I'm going to get a dozen eggs, how many eggs am I getting? Twelve. I'm going to get a dozen donuts. Twelve. We use dozen to say twelve. They used weeks to describe seven. But is it seven days? Is it seven weeks? Is it seven months? Is it seven years? Is it seven millennia? They're saying 70, seven, seven months. Seventy times seven. Now, it can be weeks. It can be 70 weeks. Yeah. It can be 70 years, uh, 70 months, because we've already passed those. Um, so it, can, it has to be either days and years. Um, so Daniel thought 70 years, and Gabriel said it's 70 times seven and he's speaking of years. So, 70 times 7 years is 490 years for the age of the Gentiles. And he gives him a reason for this. And I know what some of you are thinking. It's been more than 490 years. We're going to get to it. Don't jump ahead on me. Don't spoil anything. Um, and God gives a reason for this. He is giving us 490 years of the age of Gentiles so, Abra so that Israel can gain the benefit 
of finishing their sin under the old covenant and making an atonement for it. The age of Gentiles is judgment on Israel, but it is for their benefit in the long run. The 70 times 7 years in Daniel 9 is the age of Gentiles is going to last 490 years. Now, again, if you know your history, it's been a lot more than 490 years since Nebuchadnezzar. So where do we find ourselves in this age of Gentiles age? Look at verse number 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So Gabriel gives us a historical marker we can look to to say this is when the time starts. He says that the decree will be issued to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That's already happened in this time. Because remember, Daniel is happening the same time around with with, uh, uh, Haggai and with uh, Nehemiah. I'm sorry, Ezra and Nehemiah and all that. Same time. So the decree's already been given for them to go back and do that. So that gives us the first seven weeks. That the first seven weeks are going to be when the decree is issued. So I gave you this, but I left it blank so you can fill it in. Uh, And I'm going to put up more of it on there. So that's when the decree is issued. But then he gives us another marker. He said the street shall be built again and the wall. So he goes, the first seven weeks are when the decree is finished, is started, and the wall is finished. So our first seven years are the time when Israel returns to Jerusalem from captivity in Persia at that time, to restore the wall. Then he says, then the Messiah will come. Look at verse number 26 for the next marker. After the, and after three score and two weeks, shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be within a flood, and under the end of the war desolations are determined. So then he says, after 62 more sevens, so 62 more seven years, you know, 62 more generations, basically, um, then the, uh, where was I? All right. Okay, so uh, after 62, 69, two more sevens, then the Messiah will be cut off. So when you add these up, you've got the decree issued, the wall's finished, the Messiah cut off. How many sevens do you have? 69 of the seven, of the 70. We got one week left. That's 483 of the 490 years. Now, the Messiah being cut off is a reference to Jesus dying on the cross, but that doesn't stop the clock. Real quick, did Jesus die less than seven years ago? Now you know why Paul thought he was in the end time so much. Because he thought it's got to be seven years, so when Jesus being cut off doesn't stop the clock. We've already had four... uh, um, We've already had 483 of the 490 years. That should mean that we only have seven years left until he returned, but obviously he does not return. Look at verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So we got our last week here. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice of the, and the obulation to cease, and for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that, de- and that determined, shall be poured upon the desolate. Uh, the, uh, this describes the final week, and the, the he he's talking to is not Jesus. Anybody want to guess who the he is? Is the Antichrist. He says, during the final week, midway through the week, we're going to see this revelation, he's going to, cause a, 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 a sacrifice of abomination on the altar in Israel. And that's the, that's the final uh, week. Uh, but it, this week is not connected to all the other weeks. There's a, a break. We've got 483 weeks that happened right after, the, you know, one right after the other. The Jews returned to Jerusalem, four, you know, 462 sevens later, Jesus is sacrificed, and then the clock is paused for a while. Starts it up 
with this final seven years. Um, <laughs> you want to teach? No, I'm just making sure. Yes. Like yes, it is. So, after the Messiah is cut off, there will be a covenant just kind of hanging out uh, in, in time, kind of disconnected. So there are 70 weeks, totally, completely, but there's a pause somewhere after Christ, and it started when Jesus was crucified, and it starts up at some point. Um, the age of the Gentiles will only last 490 years, According to Scripture, but the clock is stopped right now. We're still waiting for the last seven years to start. Um, now, before we, we, I want to review before we give the last point. Back with Moses, Israel entered into a covenant with God they could never keep. The consequence of breaking that covenant brought about the age of the Gentiles to oppress and to judge Israel for their disobedience. This age began before the first coming of Christ and is going to continue until he returns to set up his earthly kingdom. This age is going to last a total of 490 years and 483 of them have already passed, but there's a pause. The pause began when Christ died on the cross and it's still paused today. When the clock restarts, only seven years remain until Israel confesses that Christ as the Messiah. But why did God need to pause the clock in the first place? Yes. Genesis 22, 18. God makes a covenant with Abraham. And, thy, and in thy seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Are we included in all nations? Yes. Yeah. He didn't say through thee the Jews will be blessed. He said, through thee, every nation on earth will be blessed. The Jewish nation and the Gentile nation. So God uses the pause on the clock to fulfill his promise that he made to Abraham to help, to, to bless the entire nation, uh, the entire world, with his seed. So what fits in that space? The church does. You're in that pause. God paused the clock for you. Look over in Romans chapter 11. Last flip, I promise. <clears throat> Romans chapter 11, verse number 25. For I would not, brethren that you, would, you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness, uh, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. 11, chapter, Romans 11, verse 25. For I would not, you brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that the blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. God has allowed Israel to be blind to Jesus as the Messiah so that we could be saved. Now, this does... If they all believed, then... If they all believed and accepted Him and... The rapture would have taken place. Yeah. And he, Jesus set up His kingdom. Now, this do, and people have taught this, this means that God, that every Jew who dies is going to go to heaven. That is not true. Israel has to confess Jesus as their Messiah for any Jew or any one to go to heaven. But yeah, just because you're Jew, you know, if you're like, well, I'm born Jew, I'm safe anyway. Oh, no, you're not. You still, now you can do it now during the age of Gentiles and the church age and receive heaven, or you can wait until after the seven year tribulation and hope you survive it and then confess it with everybody else. But we don't know when that's coming. We don't know when that's, when that's going to happen. Uh, now, during that time, the clock is paused. And God is working in the Gentile nations to see them saved. So the clock is paused for us. Now, here's another reason I am pre-trib. During these times, what's during these before before Jesus was crucified, what's similar about God working on earth? Is the Holy Spirit freely acting and moving in this time? 
No. He would come into a someone, he would use them, he would speak to them, and he would leave. During this time, Holy Spirit's freely available to every believer who receives Christ as their Savior. He never, he indwells us, he never leaves us. Then, the rapture. The church is gone. The Holy Spirit is gone. Seven year tribulation, no Holy Spirit working on earth. They still will, the same way they got saved before. Well, if the Holy Spirit's going to come down? Nope. The Holy Spirit didn't come down to see people saved in the Old Testament. He came down to do a work, to use them. So, basically, <coughs> if they get saved after that, it's going to have to be because they're like, wow, those people that said yes. they're leaving are gone. It's going to be, <laughs> and it, people will get saved, and it's going to be harder. Yeah. Now, and, and we're going to get to this later in Revelation. There will be 144,000 Jewish virgin men who go into a cave, get saved, come out preaching huge revival throughout the Jewish nation and the Gentile nation. And that's the 144,000 that God really uses to help all of Israel see He is the Messiah. We need to confess Him. And that happens right before they're about to be destroyed. And that's when Jesus comes down, destroy at the Battle of Armageddon, sets up everything. But... The clock is paused right now, and it's going to start. Because, again, all these other events, when we have timetables, we have things that you can look to in history and say, that's when the decree was issued, that's when the seven years, that, so the decree was issued, and the wall was built that seven years. You can look through Scripture and say, it literally took them seven years to get everything done. So we've got that time marker from then. Until Jesus was crucified. That's another 62 sevens. So, that's a, so that we can say, okay, from the decree until Jesus was crucified, that is historically 483 years we can look to. So for the clock to start back up, there has to be a significant historical event. And I don't know about you, but I think millions of people vanishing off the face of the earth in the blink of an eye is a pretty significant historical event to restart the clock. But here's the, thing, the clock's not started yet. We don't know when it's going to start. But when it does start, time's going to run out fast. So we need to make sure that we're accepting Christ as our Savior now before God starts the clock up. Yeah. So if you, yeah, if you wake up one day and everybody's gone, you know, hey, he was right. All right. So all that to say, uh, the clock's paused for you. God did that. God denied his people the blessing of the kingdom so he could rightly and freely and justly offer salvation to us and fulfill his promise that he made to Abraham to bless all nations. So what Israel's going through now is for our benefit. It's also for theirs, but it's for us. God saying, I'm going I'm to let them suffer so that all the Gentiles can come in. All right, any questions? Thank you for listening to this message from New Grace Baptist Church. For more information about New Grace, check out our website at www.reachingroanoke.com.